of Spain and Portugal are known as Sephardim. Sephardad means Spain in Hebrew. The Jews were transferred to the Iberic Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, following the first destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem, 586 BC. During the many centuries of Jewish life in Spain, there were good times and bad times. Muslim forces conquered much of Spain early in the 8th century. The Jews had been persecuted and forcibly converted by earlier Christian rulers. Jews welcomed the arrival of the Muslims. Under the Muslim rule, Jewish life in Spain began to flourish and indeed came to enjoy a golden age in the 10th century. The 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries witnessed a flowering of Jewish intellectual life. Rabbinical literature, Hebrew poetry, biblical studies, philosophy, and ethics. Moshe ben Maimon, Maimonides, became the single most important figure produced by Sephardic Jewry. His works in Jewish law and philosophy remain classics to this day. His achievements as a doctor, logician, and mathematician are greatly respected by Jews and non-Jews alike. Life in Christian Spain became increasingly difficult for the Jews during the 14th century, when the Christian forces conquered Granada in January 1492, the last stronghold of Islam in Spain fell. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain issued a decree to expel all Jews from Spain. Thousands of Jews converted to Catholicism in order to remain in Spain. Other thousands crossed the border into Portugal where they hoped to continue to live openly as Jews. However, Judaism was outlawed in Portugal in 1497. The mighty and benevolent Ottoman Empire welcomed Jewish refugees to its domain. Major centers of Sephardic Jewry emerged in such cities as Istanbul, Izmir, and Salonika. Sephardic refugees also found heavens in the lands of the Middle East and North Africa. The existence of the first community in Rhodes is first documented toward the end of the Hellenistic period, 142 BC. When the Jews from the Ottoman Empire migrated to Rhodes, being far more numerous, the indigenous population was assimilated into the culture and community of the new immigrants. The Jews of Rhodes enjoyed a very peaceful existence with the exception of the blood libel in 1840 that was solved with a European diplomatic involvement. Nothing disturbed the rich community life until the arrival of the Nazis and subsequent deportation to Auschwitz and other death camps.
This is the story of Sarah Levy from Rhodes as she personally narrates her journey to America, a direct descendant of those Jews from Spain who was able to transfer most of her culture acumen as well as music tradition. I am Sarah Levy. I was born in the most beautiful island in the Mediterranean, the island of Rhodes. I think my mother was born in 1914, but it could very well have been 1912. When I used to read about the island, they called it the Island of Roses and beautiful women. I was a very good swimmer, and now I cannot be modest uh, because they used to call me Peshe Kane, means uh, uh, that, uh, the big, the dangerous fish. And the boys used to come after, but the Italians are the ones I was interested in. Fell in love with one, and his name was Reno Cassini. Life was very pleasant to live with the, all the people that live in the diner. The Jews were about 4,000, and we had five synagogues. The Sephardic community in Rhodes lived in a very compact area in what is now the old city of, of Rhodes. They lived the same families for generations, uh, close to 500 years since the Inquisition. It was a very close community, but it wasn't like the ghettos in Europe in that it allowed people to come and go. My mother, on, it was, uh, her name was Miriam or Maria. She was a beautiful woman. She was 10 years older than my father. And she loved to sing also. My, my mother had seven children. My mother's father was a very quiet man. As I understand it, he rarely talked to his children and spent most of his free time reading the Torah. All I wanted was to go to see the Italians and enjoy looking and smiling with each other. The way of flirting with them was to go and, and see them. So I was Italian by nationality and uh, Jewish. Then we had the Greeks who were there before. So we had the Greeks, the Turkish, the Italians, with three cultures, we were living peacefully there and enjoying the freedom. The merchants were in one section, the Jewish, the Greeks. The Greeks had all the groceries, and the Turkish, they had all the spices and everything else together. The Jews had the dry, dry goods. The world my mother came from was medieval in many respects. The Rudisleys believed in unseen forces and had explanations for common occurrences such as uh, hiccuping would be caused by people talking about you. Dreams had a great deal of significance. Uh, there were spells and cures. And although in the wider Jewish culture there were similar uh, practices such as kissing the mezuzah before going on a trip, with the Rudisleys it was much more pervasive and lasted well into the, into the 20th century. Every night we didn't have television, only reading, and we, the climate was beautiful. We had to go outdoors, so the Italians decided that this would be the best thing to have. The Jewish people coming after they finished their dinner, whatever, to the Mandraki. But the Jewish girls and boys, they were all in the mandraki, singing, singing, singing. People would come, the windows open when it was warm. They would hear the Levy family singing oh. Passover and Rosh Hashanah. It's and we used to sing in Ladino and Hebrew, but Ladino most. Uh -huh. 
Some of the happiest moments my mother has ever known it has been when she sings the songs that she learned from her mother with her friends, all women usually. When I was born in 1914, the Italians camped, had the possession of the 12 islands in the Dodecanis. And consequently, I was an Italian subject. The Italians acquired the island in 1912. And the Italian government sent teachers as, as well as administrators of government to the island. And my mother read the Italian authors and she listened to the operas of Verdi and Puccini. And her love of the Italian culture and, and the people also continues to this day. We had also an opera house in a small island. You can imagine to have an opera house. And that was in 19, see, 1912, I, 14, I was born, I think. And they were there already. And I remember we had a theater. But we understood what our parents wanted to us to do, to marry our own and having affinities with uh, the, the Jewish people, but we thought that they were almost like cousins, even if they are they're just our friends at school. In the course of their life, I think my mother has uh, liberated herself from all of the, the restrictions that uh, her culture had when she was growing up. The one who influenced my life, whatever I do in my life now, the, the interesting things that happened to me are due to my grandmother. And I was a member, I was the only girl in Rhodes that became a revisionist. I want to go to Palestine. So my father gave 500 Italian liras and I'm ready to go to Palestine and I learned Krosh Hebrew in about a month. And all cautiously because they were concerned, 1937, things were starting to just be wrong in the island. So the governor said, it's important that you send as much, many as possible because something is going wrong. And I was going to go on a knapsack, 500 Italian liras, and I was going to go to Palestine. But then my sister Salma, who was in New York, the one who married a Jewish fellow, she said, I don't speak English. I don't know that culture. The people, my husband's family from Turkey, they speak only Turkish and Ladino, and I couldn't learn any English. So she begged my mother to send me to America. In 1933, an Austrian came, Austrian came in a, in a flat, inflatable little boat, rubber boat, and he came alone, Umberto was his name, and he said, Huber, I have bad news for the Jewish people here. Today, we have a dictator in Germany, his name is Hitler. It's going to be bad news for the Jewish people. We didn't even know anything about Germany, Austria, because all we were centered in Italy, France, and Rhodes. At the time, it was Roosevelt, the president, and they had to have a quota to come to this country. But my mother wanted to send me to my sister, and thank God for that. My grandmother said, Miriam, you know what you're gonna do? The governor, that Italian governor is philosemite. He loves the Jewish people. He's just like our own people. Why don't you make the masapan that you make so well, that almond paste? Make a nice tray, let's send it to him, compliments and all that. And then the governor said, of course I'm going to help them. 
to give permission to Sarah to go to New York. But how would she go alone? She's only 17, 19. And alone, there are no airplanes, it's by the ocean liner. My mother gave me a trunk of velvet, made in velvet, and everything was full inside, oriental rugs, three of them, and all true so that I had, and jewelry, and jewelry, and things, and the most beautiful dress. My mother's passport was clearly altered, but it's difficult uh, to know why. She never explained, and we don't know in which direction it was altered. And nobody believed that I was going to go alone without knowing the language, without knowing anything. So my grandmother said, she'll go, She's, she has courage. I taught her, and I did. I was the, the, almost the last one to leave. My school teachers, my aunts, my uncles, my friends, second cousin, children, all of those that I live with in every day of my life, and I never saw them. I was only 18 when I left, and for the last time I saw my mother waving a handkerchief. I was going to go not knowing where, how I'm going to live without knowing the language. And on the ocean liner, the captain saw that the Italians wanted me to be with them, and they said, we're gonna have, in our table, you're gonna sit with us. And they look at the way I was dressing, and I told them, well, I have an interesting dress over there in the trunk, wherever they put the baggages. And the captain said, you have the key. He took the keys, they went there, took the dress out, and they want me to wear it the last night of the, the ocean liner. And I wore that dress, <laughs> and evidently they put something on my head. They took that picture. Mussolini in Italy, Italy sent the, the Nazis to Rhodes saying that take all the Jews from there, try, send them all to concentration camp. We want everyone out from there. My father and mother went to, to crematorium the first night. They died there. Um, my mother's sister, my mother's brother, my father brother and my mother also the older brother they were about 10 15 in the family the immediate family my aunts and my uncles um, my cousins Leah the girl that I said with her little boy the first night they could not keep her because she was not going to go to work the Nazis took the girls like my sister Stella and Renee they survived and then they put them to work carrying Black, black, black. After my mother came to this country, she had lots of opportunity to speak all of her languages, and she enjoyed going into restaurants, especially in later years in California, and invariably speaking Spanish with the people that worked in the restaurants, although occasionally she would speak Spanish to somebody who came from Sri Lanka, for instance. And, uh, but most of the time, she got it right. And in the United States, she made a very important connection with the singer Judy Frankel. I remember Judy coming over and learning her first Romanceros, her songs of the culture of the Rudas Lees, of the Sephardim, from my mother. And eventually, Judy expanded her repertoire. It was very important for my mother to work with Judy Frankel, whose songs you are hearing in the background of this movie. Judy essentially created a body of material that uh, is a reminder of what the Rudas Lees and Sephardim in general, uh, what 
was important to them in their culture. The songs of the Sephardim are central to the life of, of the, at least the Rudisleys. My mother had a difficult time in the early years in this country. She worked in factories in New York and had very little money, as most refugees, and had uh, essentially a very optimistic outlook. And so when she left the East Coast for California, she really didn't know what was in store for her. My mother's lo love of Italy and Italians continued throughout her life. She loved going to Italian restaurants and speaking with Italians whenever she could. She formed a very close relationship with a family who came to the University of California as a, uh, a guest professorship. This family, the DiBiazzi's, were from Padua. And for a number of years, my mother went and stayed with them and traveled throughout Italy when they had returned to live there. One of her greatest joys, I think, was traveling in Italy and um, knowing more about the culture and people there. In my family, my daughters, my wife and I, my brothers, were able to find out what my mother's early life on roads was like by eating the foods that they ate listening to the songs they sang, and the life, the way they, the simple way they lived their life and carried themselves was exemplified in the way my mother lived. Besides the food and the music and those superstitions that my mother brought with her from the island, she also had a very definite personality that affected everyone who met her. Particularly, that's the optimistic spirit that she has. And she said that she gets that from her grandmother. And in all of the trials that she faced and continues to face in her life, she believes that, uh, that everything is going to turn out well. And with her, it usually does. My mother's in her mid-90s now, and her favorite expression continues to be, the best is yet to come. Tell them.